And, and I didn't. I didn't understand. Uh, when I went to my next CEO job in uh, Minneapolis with uh, Masaba, I made a point of deciding I was going to finally become a pilot. So went through the private pilot process. That was a lot of fun. Got a commercial multi-engine instrument rating. That was a lot of fun. And over the course of four years of uh, building time, hired every CFII I trained with. You know, these were young men and women who were passionate about aviation. Uh, these were definitely professional, well-trained, uh, again, young 20-something uh, individuals who, you know, had a desire to do something more than, than just get a job. I mean, for them, flying was passion. And, and there were no barriers that were going to stop them from achieving that goal. You know, there wasn't the focus on the career path. I mean, this is something that they, they wanted to do. And that aspirational side of flying, I still think exists today in many young men and women, but for the reasons that Dan articulated, it creates a, a lot of caution. And for the economic uh, challenges that Andrew alluded to, uh, we've put that career further and further out of reach for thousands upon thousands of young men and women. And that is a tragedy. Uh, when I was testifying in D.C., I had a chance to talk to some of the uh, uh, ALPA members who were sitting behind uh, Captain Moak. And when you sit down with, and we have many pilots in the room today, I'd love to chat with you, and you talk about how they got into the industry, many of them followed a very similar path of do-it-yourself, you know, training, perseverance, fortitude, significant sacrifice, uh, doing the, uh, the flight training. But most of these men I talked to uh, at this hearing only had three, four, five hundred hours of time before they entered into the commercial airline business. Now, I would argue that today the system is extraordinarily more safer in terms of what we've learned over those past 25 or 30 years, you know, whether it's cockpit resource management, you know, the new scheduling fatigue rules, how we train pilots, the automation on the airplanes, the automation in the system. Uh, the system learns from uh, unfortunately from accidents and we build safety into the system and to say that a pilot with you know three four five hundred hours thirty years ago was safe with the extraordinary challenges that they faced with unautomated aircraft operating with uh, an airspace that was you know, we just didn't know nearly as much as we do today that those same pilots are now somehow unsafe is, uh, is, is wrong it's factually inaccurate and so with all the challenges that it faces to, we face as an industry to aspire or inspire pilots uh, to come into the profession. And I'd say the same thing with maintenance technicians and a host, whole host of other support uh, roles in aviation in general. Uh, and with the significant expense to now layer in that an additional requirement to build a thousand hours of non-productive, unstructured time, which frankly at $200 an hour if you have to pay for it, is just, it's just not achievable. You know, we've in essence as an industry, as, an, as, an, as in a nation, we've shot ourselves in the foot. We can do better. We need to do better. And we can't, you know, hide behind an argument of uh, it's a safety issue when it's not. And we can talk about, you know, market-based pay solutions. That'll have to come in the context of a broader discussion on collective bargaining, I'm afraid. Um, but we can't ignore it. We can't run away from it. And the consequences of, uh, of uh, doing nothing I think are going to be profound in the not too distant future. So again, it's a, I would appeal to those young men and women who are at University Commons that it is a great job. And when I learned to fly, I sat down in my next collective bargaining process with the pilots. It was like, I'm on to your dirty little secret. <laughs> you know, it's the best job in the world. Um, but you have to have a passion for it. And I, I think there are thousands of young men and women in this country that would if we enable them to have a pathway to succeed. So let's work on that collectively. Thanks, Brian. Thanks to each of you for offering your perspective. This is great. Just a note on structure. I'll take the moderator's prerogative and ask a couple of questions. But as you can see, we have two mics out in the room. So if you'd like to ask a question, please uh, make your way to one of them. And when you get the mic, please identify your name and your company so we know who we're talking to. And I'll just ask our moderators also, Please, you know, especially because we have uh, one fewer participant, we have a lot of time, so feel free to talk to one another so that we can get the best conversation going and organically talk with the audience and among ourselves. I think that will be great. To start, um, Andrew, I'd, I'd just like to reflect what you said in your opening remarks is that, you know, and also you had this in your study too, 
that right now, you know, the pool, technically speaking, of pilots is adequate. And yet, you found that regional carriers are struggling to find sufficient candidates, even in spite of hiring, significant hiring bonuses, the fact that wages have increased. Um, but the regional airlines can't find the pilots and that they're unable to meet their flying schedules because of it. They've, in fact, had to reduce flights. So can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple, there are a couple of things that work. I mean, we've talked about wages. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, and the high cost of education that you know these folks are coming out with sort of large debts that they have to pay, and they're looking at really small wages to start. So um, they may not be, you know, it's not something that uh, you know it's, they're they're jumping into necessarily, and so you you definitely have that issue. The other issue is. You know, with the, ch the regulatory changes, you essentially kind of cut in half your um, pool of potential, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, employees. You've got rather than a commercial certificate, you have to have an ATP certificate, right? So, um, so you know, that's essentially cuts it in half. Um, now you've got you know folks that are coming out of school. You've got all the regional airlines now that you know there's demand that people are hiring. You've got the, the majors now announcing hiring plans, which sort of are these demand signals, you've got them all fighting over sort of the best candidates that are coming out and the top candidates that are there. So um, you know, you, those are some of the reasons why. Okay, so. if, I, if I could, but I think one of the challenges in, in your opening remarks, you said, uh, you know, let's not equivocate, you know, we have a shortage. Um, but when asked the question directly by, I forget which congressperson, to Dr. Dillingham, and, Dr. Dillingham, do we have a shortage? No, sir, we do not have a shortage. <laughs> Yeah, and, and so with these mixed messages, it's going to be really hard to focus Congress uh, and engage them in terms well, I of. I never disagree with Dr. Dillingham. <laughs> uh, Nobody else did either. <laughs> uh, no, but I mean, it's this is you know it's, this is a common kind of. I mean, this is a difficult issue, right? It's a bit of a conundrum because you've got um, an industry where uh, the larger carriers are not experiencing this shortage. You know, the majors are not experiencing shortage. They'll tell you that. They'll show you the numbers of you know that they can find ample applicants that have you know thousands of hours. Um, and so you know whether with, you know whether the industry as a whole is seeing a shortage, you know you'd have to say well no. But is there a shortage? Sure. I mean a shortage can be you know a regional thing. It can be a, you know a, a Part of this part of the uh, industry has, is facing a shortage; other parts are not. And so, you know, there's it's a little bit more of a dynamic and uh, complicated issue than just is there or is there not a shortage. Um, I, I guess how, how many of you folks have uh, read the GAO report that uh, Andrew and Dr. Dillingham put together? And uh, you folks all realize that was ten times more than any other GAO report. <laughs> you guys are plugged in. Uh, what, what, what's actually a very difficult task for someone, and I, and I assume that Andrew's introduction to the airline business was through this project, is to not understand the dynamics of why the mainline carriers don't have a shortage and why they're drawing down the, the pilot uh, from the regional and other areas. Um, and, and I think the task that GAO was, was, was asked to accomplish here is fairly difficult. Um, one of the, uh, one of the issues that, uh, that I've had with the results of the study is that Nobody in here thinks the results of a pilot shortage are mixed, that we, we have a question about it, right? Um, whether it's raining or sunny outside is pretty clear. Um, the GAO thinks it's mixed, and I think it's based on when Dr. Dillingham testified in front of Congress on three parts of a study, um, two of which I think are deeply flawed, and, and I'll tell you why. It's not a knock on the GAO, it's just being in the industry and knowing where the data sits and knowing what happened. The GAO looked to prove, in theory, what is actually happening in practice by looking at historical data from 2000 to 2012. Anybody know any exogenous variables that might have affected pilot supply during that 10-year period, which is the most tumultuous period the industry's ever experienced? The GAO completely ignored those exogenous variables in that period. So during that period, they didn't see any wage increases. In fact, pilots of most mainline carriers, which represent the majority of pilots, experienced a 30% cut in wages, benefits, and work rules. Okay? So there's no, there's no doubt about why that happened. Um, but the GAO report didn't focus on that. In fact, they looked at economic theory to see if there was a pilot shortage. Well, against Shakespeare's words, past is not prologue in this industry. It's happening now. It's a brush fire. We look like California with a bunch of dry tinder. It's going to expand. Okay. The forecasters that GAO used, in my opinion, were completely unvetted. 
One of the fellows that they relied upon heavily to forecast out whether there's a pilot shortage or not was a kid who's got a website who's the first officer at SkyWest Airlines. Now, he's probably a great pilot, probably completely unqualified to assess whether or not there's a pilot shortage in the future. In fact, there's a pilot shortage now that in his report written a year ago didn't see happening. Okay? And the pilot shortage, by virtue of the way in which pilots' careers evolve, is always going to be at the lowest end of the pay scale, which is at the regional airlines. Okay? So we're not going to have a problem at the mainline carriers. They're the last to have a problem. But I don't think they're able to avoid this problem due to the, due to the degree that the main lines depend on the services provided by people like Brian and others in this room to regional carriers. It's a big footprint. And if we don't fix this, that big footprint is going to have gigantic ramifications, not just for our industry, but for small towns, communities, manufacturers, businesses, people that are selling things in this hall. Um, we might be at the peak of the regional airline business right now. And I would hate to see that factors that are within our control add to the degradation of services that regional airlines can provide to small communities. The one fact, the practical fact, that the GAO found was that 11 of 12 regional airlines were having a pilot shortage. No surprise. When I was out on the road a year and a half, two years ago looking at this and realizing that some of the effects that the market has had on flying and pilot careers in the United States is that flight schools are full. Flight schools have been full since 9-11. Flight schools have good demand. Where do they have good demand from? Most flight schools, I'm talking about part 141, the higher level of training, have foreign students filling the bulk of their classrooms and their cockpits, okay? Those people aren't gonna be around to help us solve our problem. The flight schools probably looked at the diminishing demand by US students and went out to find foreign carriers who would pay for their training, either an ab initio or some type of loan program, to pay for their students to get trained in the United States. Go around to Phoenix, California, Florida, take a look at the students in those classrooms, mostly from Asia uh, or Europe, um, very few from the United States. And my concern right now is even if we had walked out of here with the solution, Brian could go out and fix his problem right now and get 1,500 hour qualified pilots, it takes years to do that. So to attract people today means we're not going to have pilots ready to enter the workforce for a couple of years. And that's a big, intractable lag that we've got looking at us today that is not solvable in the short term. Even if you raise entry-level pilot pay, even if you reduce 1,500 hours or some other pathway to an apprenticeship program, or if they go abroad. And the problem is pilots that come out of flight school today have between 250 and 300 hours generally. They're getting uh, recruited to fly abroad because they're hireable at that level. Whether they come back to the U.S. workforce is another question. So th this isn't just about us in the U.S., it's about the worldwide demand. And, and we can't ignore that, that at Embry-Riddle and at University of North Dakota, when people get minted with CFIIs and they come out with commercial multi-engine uh, you know, certificates like Brian had, there's going to be people pulling on their shoulders saying, come abroad, I'll give you a, a, an apartment or a nice condo, I'll, I'll, I'll take you in a limo to the airport. This is what we're facing. Uh, and, and I think the GAO report, in some sense, has been a great disservice to this, this problem, because what I've seen is that it's emboldened simple, mythological solutions to the problem. The principal one being that if we wait, raise entry-level regional pilots, we're suddenly going to have a, a big rush of these shadow pilots, the 70,000 pilots who are commercially qualified that may be in their 70s today, that may be congressmen today, that aren't going to enter the workforce, and if they are going to enter the workforce, they're going to stand in line for the $60 an hour job at mainline carriers and not the $30 or $25 an hour job at regional carriers. And that is a structural problem that we've got. Um, and there, I, I've got you know, some solutions, some sort of business models that other carriers from foreign countries have used to fix this problem, but we haven't even engaged yet. We haven't even started the structure yet. Um, so that's slinging mud at Andrew, and I apologize. Just to defend my, <laughs> our report on a couple of points, um, and I appreciate, I appreciate the criticism, but on the other hand, there, you know, we didn't just rely on a single forecast. We looked at all the forecasts that were available. Uh, and we provided a whole range of, of what that looks like um, over the next decade. So, so we didn't rely on just one 
pilot and some, you know, with a, on a computer who was blogging away. Um, just to, to clarify that. And they also, just to, to point out, I mean, when you look at a, a labor shortage, and, and we did look at it theoretically, we looked at it sort of like how would you, you know, how does, you know, one look at uh, evaluating the pilot shortage, there's no single measure for it. There's a lot of different factors that you have to bring into uh, into play to sort of evaluate what the extent of it is and what it really looks like. And so you establish a baseline looking at past uh, data, because that is data, that's stuff that actually happens, that does exist, and we don't, we didn't, I don't think, ignore the fact that over that you know, period there were you know, a, a lot of upheaval in the industry and a lot of problems in the industry that, that resulted in exactly that, that outcome. And, and I think we acknowledge that in the report. Not only that, but that, I mean, that's a, a huge reason sort of if you're not hiring, that's a signal that, you know, there, you know it's a demand signal that you know, there's no demand, there's no jobs, right? So when you start to hire, this is now a demand signal that, you know, there's going to be a lag, obviously, because you've got to you know, start to attract people back into that career path. But um, so just to defend our report a little bit. <laughs> I'm going to let you come back to all of that as well, but first we'll take a question from the audience. Other than that, I agree. Uh, good morning. Uh, to Linda Larson.